As individual gamers, there are quite a few factors that discourage us to try some games out. It could be the genre of the game, the visual style of it, or even the developer of themselves sometimes. But what is perhaps the most unfortunate limitation is probably that the game costs too much on eBay, Amazon, and the likes. These are the old famous retro games that pretty much cost an arm and leg to buy physical. These are your Sudokens, Mega Man Legends, Earthbounds, and etc. But fortunately, it does seem some of these old retro games are being made available digital so people can buy them for a reasonable price and actually try them. And the game I'm going to discuss today is one of those games. And that game is The Misadventures of Tron Bon. What's this? Capcom releasing what is perhaps the most rare game out of the Mega Man Legend series onto digital format? A natural decent move by Capcom in regards to the Mega Man series? Well hopefully this is a good sign. But anyway, being a big fan of the first Mega Man Legends game, I was pretty happy to hear that this game was being released on PlayStation Network. Albeit it was kinda left field, since there really wasn't much news to this release. Anyway, to add to my hype to this game, this game is focused on the Bond family, but more specifically Tron Bond, which is a good thing in my opinion since the Bond family are probably the strongest cast of characters in the first Mega Man Legends game. But the question that needs to be asked now that the game is readily available to most gamers at a reasonable price is, is the game fun? Well that's what I'm here to talk about, so without further ado, let's begin this review. Hello, I am Peter47890 slash Cyrus, and welcome to my review of The Misadventures of Trombone. The Misadventures of Trombone is a... Uh, well, I guess the best term to describe the game is an action-adventure game. The Misadventures of Trombone is available on PlayStation 1, as well as a PS3, PSP, and the Vita via the PlayStation Network. Though more likely than not, you'll probably be playing the PlayStation Network version, since the physical copy nowadays costs a lot. Now visually, this game is a PS1 game that uses 3D polygonal graphics and well, let's just say that a good amount of PS1 games that uses 3D polygonal graphics have it aged well. Now with that said, I do think that the misadventures of Tron Bon, and this also applies to the other Mega Man Legends games, have aged better than a good amount of PS1 games. The visuals are vibrant, colorful, and does a good job of conveying the lighthearted and charming anime as art style that the game was going for. But do note that this is still a PS1 3D polygonal graphics kind of game in terms of visuals, so you are going to see blocky yes graphics as well as pixelations. Now the environments themselves are decent looking, though they're the typical type of environments you see in video games, so they might not stand all that much though there is a decent amount of variety. Now with that said, I think the environment that actually looks good and stand out in the game to me is the Geshu Shaft, which is the main ship slash base that the Bond family resides in. Another thing to talk about the visuals is probably the 2D artwork. I think they're really well done and drawn well and add to the charm of the game, especially with how there's different artwork depending on what type of mission you're in in the pause menu. And the character conversation to the artwork slash sprite work is also well done and make the conversation to be even more enjoyable to witness. And speaking of conversations, this now gets me to talk about the voice acting. Now, this is a PS1 game of voice acting. We all know what the quality of the voice acting back in the PS1 generation. So how does the misadventures of Trombone hold up in that department? The voice acting is actually not that bad. It's actually pretty good, all things considered. And in retrospect, the voice acting in the Mega Man Legends games have been good, which is something that can't be said for most PS1 games that had voice acting in it. And in regards to this game, the voice actor does a good job portraying the characters, and do note that the same voice actor that portrayed the Bonds and the Surfbots in the first game returned to the side game. Now, 
the voice acting in uh, the Misadventures of Tron Bond isn't top-notch voice acting, but it's pretty decent to good uh, to today's standards. There's some odd deliveries here and there, but it's still a pretty enjoyable uh, dub. And in terms of the soundtrack, it's also pretty good. It's energetic, fun, and a really pleasant soundtrack to listen to. Now let's talk about the story and characters. The story basically starts out with the Bond family, which is pretty much a family of pirates, which consists of Tizo, the head of the family, and his siblings, which are Babu, and lastly Tron, aka the main protagonist of the game, as well as them having around 40 servbots, which are basically their cute robotic minions. Anyway, the start of the game basically starts out with the Bond family basically trying to find a legendary treasure at a ruin into Clyde, an underling of Loth the Lone Shark, suddenly appears and demands Tizo to pay the debt he incurred when he basically asked a loan to pay for the construction of the geyser shaft. But Tizo, not having the money, tried to convince Clyde to give him more time. But that doesn't go well, which results in a fight in which Tizo and Babu loses and gets captured by Clyde. And now Tron basically have to get the money to get her brothers back, which is about 1 million zenny. And how is she going to get the money? By robbing banks, houses, animal hospitals, livestock, ship shipments, as well as doing some digger work, which is basically the equivalent of being an explorer in the world of Mega Man Legends. The plot overall is relatively simple and lighthearted. It's just basically Tron trying to earn the money to spring her brothers free, with her meeting a bunch of quirky characters along the way, why she's earning the money into an exciting and enjoyable climax at the end. There's not much plot in the game, but it's simple to follow through and is an enjoyable ride due to the characters. And speaking of characters, I do think they are the strongest factor in enjoying the story of this game. The cast of characters are really likeable, quirky, and the banter between the characters are really fun to listen to and really humorous. I do wish that Tizo and Babu would be more in this game, but the rest of the cast are still really enjoyable with their charming personalities and comical interactions. Now to discuss the gameplay. The Misadventures of Trombone, like its predecessor, is a third person sh I mean, a block puzzle give mind. It's clearly a first person dungeon crawler. What the heck? So as you can see, the Misadventures of Trombone got a lot of different gameplay styles in it. But the first thing I will discuss is its structure. Now, if you're expecting the misadventures of Tron Bond to have like an open world for you to explore and fight enemies, like in the Mega Man Legends games, then you're going to be sadly disappointed, since the entire game is mostly structured around missions, kind of like the original Mega Man games actually. Anyway, the goal of the game is basically to earn enough money to try and pay off Tizo's debt. In order to do that, you basically go through three mission types at the start which revolves around third person shooting action, block puzzle solving, and first person dungeon crawling. And why there's really only three missions to pick from in the first half of the game, you can pick these missions multiple times, well three times, with the mission layout being pretty different from the last, it also being tougher as well as you getting more money from the mission, which will change up the gameplay and make them fun to play through. And more mission types do open up when you get to the halfway point, though the additional missions are just the same as the third person shooter missions and block puzzles, but in different areas that have different level layouts as well as expanding some gameplay features in some of them. Alongside the missions, you also have a base function where you're able to traverse through the geyser shaft where you can talk to the individual servbots and be able to improve the servbots functionality through training them in minigames and giving them specific items, as well as deciding which servbot to take in your missions. You can also sell items that you find in your missions as well as appraise them, and appraising them basically lets you know what their function is, whether they're mainly used to sell stuff or they're used to unlock a servbot's ability. 
And the game does a good job at differentiating items that are there just to sell them and earn more money, and items that are actually used to unlock a certain bot's ability. With not only the description you get by praising them, but also the icons that's right next to the name of the item. You are also able to form R&D, where you're able to get new weapons and improve armor for the robot suit that you take in your third person shooter missions, which is called the Gustav. By using money, as well as giving specific items to his serve bots in the R&D room that gives them inspiration to form the idea so you can actually now use the money to actually make it. All in all, the structure is fine as it is. Having the overall structure revolve around mission based structure is probably not what people are expecting coming from a game from the same series as the Mega Man Legend games, but the mission structure is done well, with the level design for the mission themselves being pretty decent and offering variety as you get different missions as you complete them. Well, until you complete them three times. And the game provides different gameplay styles that does make the game feel fresh as you go through the game. The layout of the menu when you're in the Gesho shop is well organized and isn't a hassle to go through when you're traversing through the ship and trying to improve the Serbots or talk with them, giving the Serbots items you find from your missions or from other Serbots themselves by talking to them, as well as doing R&D stuff. Now let's get into the main gameplay style that this game employs. The first is the third person shooter aspect of it. Now this aspect is pretty familiar to Mega Man Legends 1, with you basically traversing through the area and shooting the multiple enemies that you come across with whatever gun you got equipped. But there is one feature that is unique in this section, and that is the serve box function. Now you got the ability to basically direct the serve bots by basically firing a beacon at certain objects, which ranges them from brand sacking a building, searching through a hole for variables, or attacking certain enemies. But do note that bringing a serve bot with an attack ability that you unlock will actually improve uh, how effective they are in battle, and I'll explain about serve bots and their abilities later on in the review. Now there's one thing that needs to be said about the third person shooter aspect. Like the first Mega Man Legends game, the controls are a bit archaic in that thing, like how you can't move while locking on, how turning the camera is set to L and R, and etc. Which is really archaic nowadays, which overall can make the controls of this game to be clunky to play around. But outside of that, I think it's fun to play. The shooter aspect I say isn't as good as Mega Man Legends 1, with there not being as many weapons to collect and improve on and use on the various enemies you face. Well I think there's really only 3 weapons you can equip which is the search cannon which is basically like Mega Man's Mega Buster or default gun in the first Legends game, a Gatling gun and a bazooka. But I still think it's fun to go around shooting with those weapons, and it's especially really cool to use the Serbots in battle when you unlock Serbots with combat abilities, since they can really decimate the enemies with ease which feels pretty awesome and gives a good feeling of progression from having to train the Serbots stats and giving them the required items in order for them to pretty much decimate the enemies. Adding the French chain mission layouts and charm boss fights, you got decent gaming action that's fun to play. It's not intense action, but it's still entertaining. If you accept the fact that it suffers from somewhat arcade controls and that the third person shooter aspects is pretty much a lighter version of Mega Man Legends 1 with Serbots and the ability to throw stuff. Now to the block puzzle sections. It's a pretty self-explanatory section with the objective is to move a specific block back into the ship and you have to do it with a certain amount of moves. The puzzle sections are actually pretty fun to play through with you having to be a bit creative in solving the puzzles, which makes it pretty fun, especially if you're trying to get the bonus block. And the puzzle sections get additional mechanics as you get to the second half of the game, where they implement cranes and forklifts into the formula, which does change the gameplay up. Now the last gameplay style that's offered in the missions is the first person dungeon crawling. In this section, you basically just traverse through a dungeon in a first person perspective via using one of Tron's robots who is accompanying the Serbots and progress through it via talking to characters, using the Serbots to disarm traps, explore the nook and cranny of the dungeons to get the keys to unlock the way to the boss, as well as finding optional content like Uncle Dig's hints and eventually unlocking the final door and being the boss using the Serbots. 
Now I say I enjoyed the first person dungeon crawling just for the interaction done between the characters as well as the exploration aspect of it. I'll probably say that this arming trap part of the dungeon crawling isn't all that exciting since you're basically just trying to find a switch and point the server bots at it. And I do wish there were some actual puzzles involved in the first person dungeon crawling. I know there is a block puzzle solving mission already. But I would appreciate a puzzle in the form of a 3D dungeon, which would make the first person dungeon crawling aspect of the game to be more fun, and it fits with the whole exploring ruins aspect of this section. As is, the first person dungeon is not bad, but I probably might find it the weakest mission types of the game. Overall, in the end, I wouldn't say that the different gameplay styles present in the game is the best designed, but I say they're still overall still fun with the game providing you lots of a variety to make the game feel fresh from start to finish with the differentiating gameplay modes, especially if you are alternating between the different missions as you progress the game. Again, they are flawed in some way, but are still fun to go through. But now let's get to the last important aspect to talk about, which is the Serbots and the progression system that revolves around them. Now the Serbots do play a big part of the game, with each Serbot having their own unique abilities and parameters that make them ideal for certain roles in the game, from fighting in battle in the third person shooter and first person dungeon crawling missions, to helping you develop better armor and weapons for the Gustav to even changing the color of the Gustav itself, to giving you better hints during the puzzle sections if you bring the right Serbots, etc. And there are 40 Serbots in total that each got their own unique parameters and abilities and even personalities. But the thing is, is that most of the Serbots got their abilities hidden and you unlock them by upgrading the parameters as well as giving them specific items. To upgrade the parameters, there are several mini games that upgrade the attack power, speed, lower the sloth so they don't become lazy, and finally the mine parameter will increase by taking them into missions. Once you upgrade the parameters to the maximum uh, and giving specific items to some of them, you unlock their special ability which will overall improve their effectiveness in the role they play. Such as uh, Surbot unlocking the attack ability like Bombardier I think it's called, will actually throw bombs at an enemy when you use them in battle, well when you direct them in battle, which will prove really effective. Or getting a Surbot to unlock their development ability, which will allow you to actually get the weapon you're trying to develop. Or various other Surbots that got some other miscellaneous uh, features you can unlock like getting hints on how to train the Serbots, or as I said, painting the Gustav, and etc. Overall, the Serbot system is really well done. The mini games you use to increase your stats are actually pretty fun to play around with and varied, though it gets really tough when you're trying to max a specific stat. The Serbot's abilities also do feel very significant to learn, with the amount of functions that unlock when you learn their ability, or just seeing how much more powerful they are in battle, which gives a great feeling of progression in the game, with each Serbot do feeling unique from each other. And it's overall just tons of fun training each individual Serbot and seeing what their hidden potential is, and unlocking their uh, ability in the game itself. I would probably say that the serve bot system is probably the most fun aspect of the game. Likewise, it took me around 12 hours to beat, and in terms of difficulty, uh, I probably didn't find it all that hard, though some of the puzzles might get you stumped for quite a while. Overall, The Misadventures of Tron Bond is a really fun and charming game to play. The story characters are charming as well as the art style, the gameplay is varied and fun to play through, and the surf bots are an absolute blast to train and use in the game. Now there are some missteps such as the arcade controls, and not every gameplay mode hits it out of the park, but if you can get past that, I will say that the game is worth buying on PlayStation Network.